How are y'all? Good. So um, I'm going to talk about I'm with stupid today, or better, collaboration. How many of you all are hearing the word collaboration all the time and are being asked to collaborate? And Yeah? It's a big word right now. I sucked at collaborating when I first got into this business. I might still not be great at it, but I wanted to share with you some things that I've observed about myself and about some of the things that I think get in the way of collaboration. And this is the first one. I'm with stupid. I don't know about you guys, but like when you came here today, every time you come into one of these conferences, do you go, I wonder if it's gonna be any good? I wonder if they're gonna disappoint me. How good, I don't know if this subject's gonna be very interesting. So when you walk in, you know, are you walk in with like, hey, I can't wait to hear this, it's gonna be great, or are you walking in with sort of like a prepared to be disappointed? And if I walk up here, am I walking in going, I wonder if anybody's gonna listen, or if they're just gonna wave to their friends the whole time. Hi. <laughs> but how you, how you approach a relationship, especially when you're not getting paid by the same company and you're not working maybe under the same value system or the, even the same goals, what do you do? And I used to, I have to say, I'm in advertising and when I would go in to present to a client, I really was like, man, they're gonna mess up my idea. This is not gonna go well. And they're probably not gonna say anything that helps the work get better. They're probably just gonna hurt it. I wasn't a very good attitude. So anyways, this is where I started with every time I walked into a room where I had to collaborate, um, I kind of felt like I was with stupid. And then on the other hand, there were a lot of times where I kind of felt stupid and I had clients looking at me or other people I was collaborating with and I didn't feel comfortable enough to say, I actually don't know right now. I don't know what the answer is. So I was trying to look smart and probably came off them thinking also, I think I'm with stupid. So what do we do? Here are some things that I think um, I saw hurting my relationship with people I was collaborating with. And one of them is what I call the ta-da effect. And that's when how many of you, if you're on the maker side, want to keep your idea, your thing you're making really close to you until it's perfect, until it's ready for prime time? You don't like to show it like in its, you know, when it's kind of coming along. I think that today, if you really want to be a great collaborator, you have to trust that the people that you're working with um, are smart enough, not stupid enough, to see things in progress. And what I've seen in the last 20 years is going from this ta-da idea to actually having a conversation along the way. And by the time you actually get to showing the work, everybody's kind of with you. So it's just, a, it's, instead of a ta-da moment, it's more like a, can we all agree and let's go. Another thing that I hear a lot in our business is, I've got the scariest, most edgy idea for you and I need you to be brave enough to buy it. How many people get excited and it's like, oh my God, this is, I got an idea that's gonna scare the crap out of you. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna do anything that's gonna scare the crap out of me. And this is like, I feel like it's when you're asking people to buy ideas like that, you're actually, they feel, they must feel the same as if you're gonna push them off a cliff without a parachute. I don't know who gets jazzed about that. So to me, what I think we can do to collaborate is to not make ideas that are edgy and, and pushing the envelopes. Don't make them scary, make them viable. You know, I, I talked to some of my CMO friends that I think buy out their progressive work that I would think would be risky. And what they tell me is that they use data to look at the numbers and avoid the risk. It's like, you know, here's, if I do this idea, here's the downside. We hear data and analytics all the time. This is where I think it really applies. You can figure out based on risk, you know, what's, what's the upside and the downside. And I think we can make things that seem scary actually not be scary if we present them the right way. So I don't ever want to go into a client and go, you're going to be living right on the edge with this idea. Um, I've talked about this a lot, which is bravery. I um, was in a meeting a few years ago and the CEO of the company said, look, I need to hire braver marketers. I know that. I need you right now to help me um, and push, push the marketers I have. And I'm going to work on hiring braver people. And I was so excited because I thought we're going to start doing incredible work. And then I got about halfway to the office and I realized that bravery is actually not a characteristic of a human being. It's an outcome of culture. 
And what I realized is that he could hire all the brave people in the world, but until he created a culture within his company that allowed them to make brave decisions, like how they were bonused, you know, how they were judged, even the bravest, even the best marketers in the world would not be brave in that company. Another thing I've noticed with collaboration is that we tend to play it more like tennis. So the person I'm collaborating is over there and I'm over on the other side of the net and we're hitting as best we can. But our goal isn't to create something. Our goal is actually to win the argument with each other. I don't know how many times you find that you're in a meeting and it's like, I, I know I get consumed. I'm like, I'm just going to win this point. And I suggest that we don't play tennis when we collaborate, but we play a team sport. And to me, the team sport is having one goal that we all agree on. So like in basketball, it's to get that ball in that basket. It's not to dribble faster or run down the court faster or, you know, defend or cause a turnover. It's just to get a ball in a basket. And everybody on that team shares that goal and they know what they do best to do that. So a client might be like, I know how to sell it internally to my team. Um, you, everybody plays a different role and the more you know those roles and respect them, I think you get to collaboration much faster. Another thing I realized is that when I would present an idea to my client and they would say yes, I didn't realize that they had to go back to their company and sell that idea into a lot of people. And when I realized that they had as big of a job, I had, to, I had to get my idea through my corporation, but then I had this empathetic moment where I realized they have to do the same thing um, on their side. And it gave me, a, a, I think, empathy for who you're working with and understanding what they have to do inside their company really helps you understand how they, how they come to work and how they come to the team. Also, what I realized is that at some point in collaboration, my idea has to become our idea. And one of the things that I've seen, and you know, look, I think it, I think it comes from a good place, is that we, always, we all want to prove our value. And we all know the thing that we come up with is the thing we are the most comfortable with and we know the most. But how many times have you seen two or three ideas when you're collaborating and you defend yours more because it's yours? may not be the best idea in the room. It may not be the right thing to do, but because it came out of your company or your, your head or your heart, you don't want to let it go. And I think learning to let go and seeing another idea and feeling fine about giving yourself, I think the points to say, I recognized it was a good idea and that's enough. It doesn't have to be from me to be a part of it. So to go from making my ideas to our ideas and sometimes being a part of someone else's idea is just as rewarding than having your own. Thank you. Um, I think part of leadership and part of collaborating and leading a collaborative group is knowing when um, to say we've got it. I had an experience where we were, we were pulling off a pretty big idea for Allstate Insurance, which were, it was a TV show inside a football game where a character went into someone's house who was at the football game and basically sold everything online on an e-commerce site during the football game. And we were going to film the people who were at the football game watching and realizing that because of social media, they had put themselves in a vulnerable position where they could get robbed or burglarized, I guess. And we did it, we pulled it off. But the team, the creative team was so insistent that the people at the football game couldn't know what was gonna happen to them at the football game and when they saw their house being burglarized. And the client said, I can't do this idea if we are actually going to punk people. We're an insurance company, we build trust. And it was me, I stepped in and I said, look, you've got 90% of your idea and it's an amazing idea. Why, why are you going to throw it away? Because one piece isn't right. And the client really is having a hard time. I said, it's like, you've got an ice cream sundae and you got the ice cream, you got the chocolate fudge, you got the peanuts, you got the whipped cream. And you're like, where are my sprinkles? And I give, we'll just, we're out of sprinkles today. It's like, 
have the ice cream sundae. And I think a lot of times in collaboration, we fight for every last detail and we don't realize that sometimes there are one or two things when you're collaborating that you, go, you gotta let go for the sake of the bigger picture. Um, so eat the ice cream sundae, even if you don't get the sprinkles. Another thing that I think is important about collaborating is that um, a lot of times you go in thinking the answer is gonna be here. And when you start having more people get involved, you realize maybe the answer is over here. And I, I equate it to if you're in the diamond business and you find emeralds, I would go into the emerald business. I wouldn't say, well, we came here for diamonds, so oh, glad we found the emeralds, but that's not what we're into. Don't let being stubborn about what you thought you were going into when you started collaborating halt the collaboration or, or um, not let you progress to maybe something even better. Another thing about collaborating that I think is important, especially um, I found this with clients, a way that a client can get better creative out of me or better work. How many people who have been presented to have been given the advice of don't show any emotion? Keep a poker face when you're looking at work, when someone's showing you work. I hate that advice. We're humans. We're in an emotional business, especially in branding and advertising. I want the people I'm presenting to, like you, you know, to be emotive, to, 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 to care, to think, to laugh, to cry, to get chill bumps. And I really, I think that we build up distrust when we're sitting there, you know, being presented to with our arms crossed and trying to contain it and keeping it all internal. And so when you're sitting there with your arms crossed, you're actually creating, I think, an a environment of distrust. So be vulnerable with your emotions. Be open and transparent with your emotions. Don't, don't close off to the people that you're trying to build something with. This one's huge, listening. I swear, it's probably made me advance in my career more than any other skill set I possess is listening. And I always say that we're a bunch of smart, clever, interesting people out there. How many of you, when you're in a room and people are talking, you're already formulating your response of what you're going to say and how smart you're going to look in the room? You're so busy thinking, what am I going to do that you don't listen to what actually is happening? And I found that to really listen is super hard, especially when you're in a room collaborating and having your own opinions and your own point of view and trying to protect your own um, ideas. So collaborating and listening, I think listening might be the biggest care. Sincere listening, like really believe that you're not with stupid, but you're, you're with someone who is saying something and by opening their mouth, it must be, you're gonna, you're gonna approach it as being important and a clue to maybe a better outcome. There's also a thing I think that we can do, which is to um, look at the details of when you're working with someone. I know, who likes to communicate through text? Who likes emails? Who likes a phone call? Who likes an adult beverage? Yeah. Um, find out how the people you're working with like to communicate. I personally hate long emails. If it's more than three sentences, I delete it. And then people think that they've just shared like a tomb with me about their entire feelings for the next, you know, four months. And I'm like, no, I got nothing. I don't know what, what you're about. So find out how people like to work. It sounds like a small thing. I had a, I had a guy come by uh, my office, he was an account director, and he, he would always come by with bad news. He'd be like, uh, Susan, can I come in? I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, come on in. And it would be like, well, the client called, and they're not happy. And, I'm, and every time, that's all he, he came by every time with this bad news. And um, he ended up leaving, and I met him at a party that was unrelated to advertising, and he was a really nice guy. And I was like, you know what, you just made me realize something. You always came by with bad news and I developed a Pavlovian response to your presence. Maybe you should have showed up every once in a while just with a, hey, how are you doing? Is everything good? Uh, just stopping by to say, hey. So I've, uh, there's an element of surprise, not an element of disappointment. So think about how you show up in those relationships and are you building excitement for that relationship or the eye roll shrug oh dear god that person's on the phone texting emailing you know usually if you're having an adult beverage together it's a pretty good sign um it's going well and speaking of that one of the things that i learned is especially when you're trying to sell things to other people or get them to buy into your idea 
is that I was only meeting my client when I was trying to sell something to them. So I would sit around a table and I had an agenda. I need to get this thing that I made or we made for you to say yes to. And um, what I realized is that it was much better when sometimes I met with the clients and we just went out to dinner and discussed ideas, you know, general ideas about our business, our industry, about family, about life. And by b doing that and taking an agenda off the table, all of a sudden we developed a much more trusting relationship. And when you have a trusting relationship, the collaboration gets much easier. And then I would even say doing things like this, building your own brand, that if I walk into a room and, I, and the person I'm collaborating with feels that I've done well, you know, and that, I, that I've shown up in the industry, the odds are they're gonna listen a little more and trust a little more. So build your brand and make sure that when you walk into a room, somebody knows that what you have to say or what you bring might be valuable. I've been asked a lot about in-house agencies and am, am I nervous about in-house agencies uh, taking over more traditional agency, agencies? And I'm not, I think there's a great, I think there's, I think in-house agencies are great. Some do the creative part better. I think some do the programmatic pieces much better. But here's what I like about agencies that um, have more than one brand are in their um, portfolio is that we learn from each other. So you, you do lateral problem solving. And I think that's an interesting part about collaboration and, and agencies is that if I'm in an agency, I want all my people to be talking to each other because as they share problems and ideas uh, with each other, I think every client that, that comes to our company benefits. I, I talked to some people that had worked on the advertising side and the client side and asked them, you know, their feelings. And one of the things that um, I loved, and I call it working above the brief, but when we're on a client's business, I think it is our responsibility to know enough about their business and their brand that we can be proactive in what we bring to them, not just wait for a brief or an assignment. And this friend of mine described it as just, you know, thinking on your feet. He's just like, this world is moving so fast. And she said, I know sometimes now that I'm on the client side, I now understand that what I thought was a stupid client or an undisciplined client or a lack of power client was actually a client living in the fluidity of today's market. And so what was true yesterday, looking for diamonds, today we might have found emeralds and we've got to move and adjust. So it, it was amazing the realization she had coming from the agency side and then moving over to the client, how important being fast to adopt and adapt uh, was and how much more empathetic she was to that. Another person said what they saw when they went from one side to the other is that there were just too many layers. He said, we're spending millions of dollars in marketing the client must get the smartest, the most powerful people in the room to make those decisions. It's not fair to the younger people to have them have to, to work their way up to getting the, the, the most powerful person in the room. I did, um, when I worked on Mars, I spent one month where we went layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. And it took us three weeks to do one billboard in a regional market. And we ended up doing the first thing we had presented the first week. And I said, you know what, we're not working. This isn't working well, let's change it up. How about if, um, if we do it all in one day and we'll start with the youngest clients in the morning and we'll get all their thinking, ideas and discussion. We won't make any changes to the work, but we'll go to the mid-level client, get their discussion. At the end of the day, we'll go to the CMO with all their thoughts and all their you know, questions and curiosities and um, we'll do it that way. It was amazing. It was a game changer. We got so fast, so good, so smart. And the coolest part is that those marketers, those young marketers got to see their CMO react to the same work. And he actually taught them the kind of work that he wanted them to do and learn. So it, it helped everybody. And then the other thing was, you know, if you don't do it this way, you end up playing the telephone game. By the time the idea makes it up that rank, whatever you said at the beginning does not look like what you show at the end. Then the, the other thing about collaboration that I think is incredibly important is you gotta like each other. I, um, I've done my best work with people I just really enjoy. I enjoy being with them, I enjoy hanging out with them. And you know, if you don't feel that, that chemistry, 
I think it's going to be really hard to truly be great collaborators. And I think you just have to, you have to work on finding those people that you want to show up with every day. The last thing I'll leave you with is something that I truly believe is important in leadership and in collaboration. When I first started in my job as a, as a writer and, a, uh, and worked up to a creative director, I operated in a culture of scarcity. I, I, I actually had this thing of like, it's never going to be, we're never going to get a good brief again, that we're never going to have a better client. I'm never going to have a better partner. Um, I'm never going to have a better opportunity. And what happened was, I sort of live life like this, which is not a very collaborative looking physical stance. It's closed off and very inward looking. And so I thought, if this is how I feel and I don't like it, what if I just reframed it the opposite and said, what if I thought about being in a culture of abundance? That there's always going to be new talent. There's always going to be great opportunity. There's always going to be new briefs and new companies. I mean, all of you are opportunity for, for my business of like building brands. Always going to be more that there's enough to go around. How would I behave if that were the case? If that's how, my, that's how I believe the world worked. And it looks like this. That's a much better, I don't know, just as a human being, I, I want to be that person rather than the first person. And it comes down to something that I, I truly believe is that generosity is not only the key to great leadership, but I think it's the great key to collaboration. That every time you choose to be generous, whether you're listening, whether you're giving someone the benefit of the doubt, whether, then you're, whether you're bringing someone in early to your process, generosity it pays back in dividends and it's it's just interesting that the math shouldn't work the more you give away you the less you should have but i will tell you the more i give away the more i get every time and um so i say if you can if you can switch from i'm with stupid when you walk into a room to collaborate with someone to i got your back i think you'll be well on your way to having not only a great collaborative experience but making some pretty incredible things so thank you